Is R. Kelly a sex symbol or a sex offender? There's only one opinion that matters. The jury. The question of Kelly's guilt or innocence remains as controversial and uncertain as ever. You ain't got the answer, Sway. You ain't got In 2002, answer. R. Kelly's career is booming. He's gearing up for the release of his collaborative album with Jay-Z, The Best of Both Worlds. He's also planning to release his chart-topping album, Chocolate Factory, and it is then that he decides to transcend the world of music and make his mark on the world of film. And a sticky mark it was. In Kelly's directorial debut, it looked like the man that wrote The World's Greatest was gonna go down as the world's greatest pedophile. In 2002, a Chicago paper received an anonymous delivery of a videotape that appeared to depict R. Kelly engaging in sex acts with an underage girl, directing her through scenes where he would record himself having sex with a girl and eventually using her face as a toilet. This video leaked and eventually went as viral as herpes after you've slept with R. Kelly, allegedly. This thing went viral before going viral was even a thing. People were selling it on street corners and at swap meets, and it kind of says something about the attitude towards child pornography at the time. Now, before we get into this story, I just wanna make one thing clear. I try and make the stories that I tell on my channel as objective as possible. The purpose of this video is basically to just look at the facts. I've made it no secret that I really don't think much of R. Kelly. I've mocked him in quite a few of my past videos. In my opinion, it's really not acceptable to stick your key in a 14-year-old's ignition unless you're buying a pre-owned Bentley. But I also don't want to over-sensationalise the story or twist the narrative to pursue any kind of agenda. I watched the recent Surviving R. Kelly documentary and I did think that it was incredibly compelling. To me, that series really did shine a light on some incredibly strong women who were extremely brave to put forward their stories of abuse at the hands of R. Kelly. But in my true opinion, no matter how well told or compelling a story is, nothing will supersede the judicial process, which I think everybody has a right to. So I just want to make it clear that this video is only going to be concerned with the facts of what happened on that case. I'm obviously going to take a few shots at R. Kelly through the course of that, but keep in mind this is neither a defense of R. Kelly's actions, nor is it a takedown trying to discredit the man. It is just a look at the pure facts of what happened in the case and why he was able to beat this case. So with that out of the way, let's look at what happened. On the face of it, it looks like R. Kelly may have produced one of the biggest legal finesses since the O.J. Simpson case. And not only did R. Kelly beat all of the charges that were leveled against him, but he also managed to delay the entire trial for six whole years from 2002 when this video actually surfaced all the way up to 2008 when he actually stood trial and was eventually acquitted. And that six year gap is very interesting because R. Kelly essentially was able to just get on with his career. He managed to put in a lot of work during this period. He got to sing an R&B rendition of the national anthem at the Taylor Hopkins boxing match. What's so which I thought was really interesting to see R. Kelly's face in a ring that didn't belong to a 14-year-old girl. It was during this period that the trial was delayed that R. Kelly also was able to drop his album Chocolate Factory, which did absolutely amazingly in the charts, hitting number one on Billboard, as well as spinning out the huge singles Ignition and Step in the Name of Love. The album was initially called Loveland, but that title was changed after it ended up leaking on the internet, which is unusual because usually R. Kelly's leaks end up on the faces of teenage girls. It was also during this period that R. Kelly started a lucrative side hustle as a pepper spray tester for Jay-Z's crew. And if you don't know anything about that story, I definitely recommend you go and check out the other video on my channel, Why R. Kelly Sued Jay-Z for $75 million. Also, during this period, R. Kelly worked on features for countless musicians. And I know what you're thinking, who would possibly get involved with an unethical train wreck like this? Well, of course, Ja Rule. But it wasn't just the Fire Festival scamming clown that was involved with R. Kelly during this period. There is an enormous laundry list of rappers that were still willing to work with R. Kelly whilst these child sex charges were unresolved. During this time, he worked with Fat Joe, Twister, Wycliffe John, Snoop Dogg, Swizz Beats, T-Pain, Bow Wow, Ludacris, Nelly, The Game, Nick Cannon, Young Jeezy, and even fellow famous child kisser, Birdman. The six year delay for this trial was an interesting tidbit, but the responsibility for that delay was spread amongst several people. It wasn't necessarily just a legal finesse for R. Kelly to try and dodge responsibility for his actions. The judge admitted his role in delaying the case after falling off of a ladder and breaking several bones and being out of work for a little while. New evidence emerged in the horrific Brown's Chicken Massacre of 1993, which meant that that trial now had a new suspect which was set to go to trial. So this had to take place in 2007 before the R. Kelly trial, and a lot of the procedure around how the media were handled during that trial was also used in the Kelly case. So after six years of basically running things at a high level in the music industry, R. Kelly finally gets a court date. And as we all know, he went on to beat that trial 
harder than P. Diddy beat Drake. R. Kelly was actually facing 14 counts of child pornography, seven for producing and seven directing, but every cloud has a silver lining and these charges did actually mean that R. Kelly was able to qualify for best newcomer at the 2008 Child Porn Awards. Unfortunately, he did end up losing out on that award to Roman Polanski. The Oscar goes to Roman Polanski for the pianist. Well, the key case made by R. Kelly's defense lawyers later went down to be known as the Shaggy defense. They basically got up on the stand and said, it wasn't me. Oh, we know what you look like. There's a damn soul train of water right next to the bed. Well, the prosecution did have a little bit of a battle on their hand. In order to win the case, they basically needed to prove three things. That R. Kelly was the man on the tape, that the girl in the tape was underage, and that the tape itself was genuine. So Kelly's team used the Shaggy defense in order to cast enough doubt into the jury's mind that it wasn't him on the tape and that the tape was not authentic. They made the interesting argument that somebody had used some kind of CGI or special effects to essentially frame him or extort him for money. It sounds ridiculous, but a big part of this defense was the mole. Mole. It was suggested that R. Kelly has a very distinctive mole on his back, which didn't appear in the video. The jury found this argument compelling, despite the fact that apparently in one of the scenes you could actually see the mole, but his lawyers argued that this was actually a video artifact rather than the mole, and you could see it kind of appear and disappear in certain shots. I personally am surprised that this argument was allowed to go through. Although you couldn't see R. Kelly's distinctive mole, I think you could probably make the case that that's not as important as being able to see R. Kelly's distinctive face, the distinctive interior of a property that he is known to own, and also his distinctive patented love of having sex with underage girls. R. Kelly's eating this girl's ass out like he's got diabetes and her ass got insulin in it. But setting aside the shaggy defense, it wasn't just that that the jury found compelling. It was also the lack of test testimony from the girl who was accused of being the underage girl in the tape. And it was this key element of doubt that left the jury pretty much unable to convict Kelly. This was extensively covered in the Surviving R. Kelly documentary, where the pop singer Sparkle claims that the girl in the tape is actually her niece. Unfortunately, that girl never came forward. She claimed that it was not her on the tape, as did her own parents. Despite her testimony, the defense team were able to discredit Sparkle, saying that she only claimed that it was her niece in the video to get revenge on R. Kelly for dropping her from his label. The fact that she didn't turn up to testify put enough doubt in the jury's mind not to convict him. In a move that seemed to further discredit that it was actually this girl in the video, Van Allen, a woman who was featured extensively in the Surviving R. Kelly documentary, who claimed to have taken part in three-way sex sessions with R. Kelly and this same underage girl, was called to the stand. Kelly's defense team went hard at discrediting her, even planning to call to the stand the father of her child, who was previously convicted of bank fraud, with the defense arguing that those two had concocted this scheme to try and extort R. Kelly. Interestingly, during questioning, she admitted stealing a $20,000 Rolex from R. Kelly, which only served to further discredit her. Furthermore, Chicago reporter Jim DeRogatis, who was the person that originally received that sex tape, failed to turn up to his scheduled court appearance, ending up in court a day later and refusing to answer any questions. The final nail in the coffin was the suggestion that the woman that appeared in the tape wasn't in fact who they said she was and was simply a prostitute who was a professional who had been paid to appear in this tape having sex with somebody to try and extort R. Kelly. This claim was mainly based around the fact that at the start of the video, R. Kelly is seen handing money to the woman. The prosecution claimed that that girl who was in the video, Sparkle's niece, was also R. Kelly's goddaughter. Even the recording of this disgusting sex act is still more watchable than The Godfather 3. All of the doubts that were created by the R. Kelly defense team were enough to convince the jury that there wasn't enough evidence to be sure that that was him on the tape, that the girl was underage, and the tape was real. So, R. Kelly walked free. Superstar not guilty of videotaping himself having sex with a minor. Kelly was charged with 14 counts of child pornography, but jurors acquitted him on every charge. A lot of people have suggested that the jury was soft on R. Kelly because they were dazzled by his celebrity at the time. This was reflected in a lot of media around this period. He urinated on a 15-year-old girl. That piss was digital. <laughs> I didn't even just do this. Much like the O.J. Simpson trial, people have also suggested that perhaps race may have played a part. That's not necessarily something that I personally would speculate on, but it was interesting to find out that the racial makeup of the people in that jury were four black and eight white. So 
That is how R. Kelly beat his first case, and with all the recent allegations that have followed on from the surviving R. Kelly documentary, it looks like R. Kelly is likely to face trial once again for a different child sex video allegation. Some might argue that the fame and notoriety R. Kelly has, as well as his history of having to fight these kind of cases, may mean that it's almost impossible for him to get a fair trial. Also, keep in mind the huge advances in CGI technology since that first trial mean that it's possible that R. Kelly could just keep using that shaggy defense, and if anything, it stands up even more today. So it's highly possible that R. Kelly might go to trial again and not only beat his case, but also pick up a lucrative role in the next Avatar film. I hope you enjoyed that video. Make sure that you like and subscribe below. Hit the notification bell so you can see every single time that I upload. And of course, if you're liking my Trap Law merch, definitely go and hit the store in the link below. Make sure that you go and cop one of those and support the channel. Until next time, peace out.